today is child overweight and obesity. So you are in the right place. Last week, I defined the eating competence model and built the bridge between eating competence or lack of it and child obesity. Today, we talk about prevention and treatment. As I reviewed your notes, and thank you so much for your questions, I found you're asking the right questions and that most of those questions will be answered in today's presentation. The main concern that you had was about regaining eating competence for an adult or adolescent who's lost eating competence. In my book, Secrets of Feeding a Healthy Family, Part 1, How to Eat, I talk in detail about the components of eating competence. Chapter 4, Eat as Much as You Want, shows how to regain internal cues of hunger, appetite, and satiety. Someone wondered about rehabilitating the eating competent adolescent. I would suggest to you that you can only rehabilitate an adolescent who is interested in rehabilitating himself or herself. More than one person heard me saying that structure is more important than nutrition. To clarify, structure comes first, and establishing and maintaining structure calls out improved nutrition. We all know we're supposed to eat vegetables, for instance, and telling us still again won't make it happen. The structure of meals, however, seems to call for vegetables, and most people who establish structure will sooner or later include vegetables. On the other hand, insisting on nutritional principles impairs structure. Parents get overwhelmed with following nutritional rules and have trouble putting together meals. Now, Turning to today's topic, appropriate growth depends on harmonious feeding, and harmonious feeding depends on establishing and maintaining a division of responsibility in feeding. The parent does the what, when, and where of feeding, and the child does the how much and whether of eating. When parents follow DOR, feeding is joyful and rewarding. Too often in addressing child obesity or any other feeding and growth problem, Parents are given an agenda that destroys their trust in the child to do his or her part with eating. As I showed you last time with all those static slides, when parents have an agenda, feeding is a maddening business full of conflict and frustration where the job is never done. In such a context, the child does a poor job with eating as much as he needs and growing in the way that's right for him or her. Here are the three main topics for today. As I told you last week, the feeding dynamics model concerns itself with upward with abnormal upward weight divergence for the individual child, not with statistical cutoff points established for the purposes of population wide evaluation. This is review from last week. I'll be going through these growth charts twice, once to assess the growth pattern and once to tell you the backstory. Obviously, this is normal average growth. This is also normal growth, although this child is perking along at the third percentile. It's normal because it's consistent and smooth. Same here, high, fast, consistent, smooth. Um, this child is growing at around the 97th percentile. Normal growth can show smooth, gradual shift. It took Curtis 10 years to diverge downward from somewhere around the 95th, 97th percentile to the 50th percentile. Just very gradual shift over time. However, an abrupt and rapid growth uh, divergence is unlikely to be abnormal. After some catch-up growth early on when Haley's weight um, dipped up from the 75th to about the 95th percentile, she stabilized at around the 95th percentile for about eight months before it became inconsistent. So she amply demonstrated her ability to regulate food intake uh, before it became inconsistent. So we need to ask, we need to wonder what happened, what created this growth divergence, it, it doesn't come out of thin air. 
based on our discussion last time, we're asking what introduced so much static in feeding that Haley lost her ability to regulate food intake. From this growth chart, it appears that the static is intermittent. And I believe I told you last week this is a stock photo, but it so captures Haley that it just makes me laugh. She's the kind of kid who looks at you and says, you want me to do what? Sometimes growth divergence is not so easy to detect. Christopher's weight for length was gradually and smoothly sneaking up on the mean, and he was showing evidence of good internal regulation. But then it quickly crossed two percentiles, leveled off, and began accelerating again. To detect the difference between normal and abnormal growth, we have to find out what's going on with feeding by asking those feeding questions I showed you last time. What, how's feeding going? Would you like anything to be different? How do you feel about your child's growth? And then between three and a half and four and a half years, Christopher's weight really took off. Erica was born large and got larger still during her early months. This is highly unusual, but she could still be showing normal catch-up growth. The only way to know, know is by asking feeding questions. And I, I truncate the chart, so you know I want you to see these little parts down below better. These charts are set up with 97 and third percentile. So if you're used to looking at growth charts, you can kind of figure it out. Erica's growth chart got more unusual as time went on. What in the world is going on here? Uh, BMI plotting show the same shape and exaggerate the changes. For a child whose growth plots beyond the standard percentiles, it's so helpful to plot z-scores or standard deviations. I talked about z-scores in both the article I gave you and in chapter 10 in and uh, your child's weight. And I'm planning to write a family meals focus edition about how you can figure out and plot D scores. This zero point is the 50th percentile. Um, one is about the 85th percentile, and a Z score or standard deviation of two to two and a half is around 95th and 97th percentile. So we can see that Erica was a big girl. She plotted at the eight, you know, one Z-score, 85th percentile. And then by the time she was two months old, she went way up here to almost the three and a half Z-score. And at that point, you know, her weight uh, sort of leveled out until it began, again, going down between uh, three and six and a half years. Here's Ryan. When was static introduced into Ryan's feeding? You know, how was feeding going? We have Ryan who suddenly took off from his growth curve and then really took off between two and seven years. This should be a two. When did the problem start? You know, plotting it as BMI doesn't calibrate growth. But plotting a z-scores does help. And here he was. He perked along at about the 75th to the 85th percentile during his first 12 months. And then he had a sudden acceleration between 12 and 18, and another big leap between two and four years. No surprise, once you start seeing acceleration, it has a tendency to keep going. But this part is surprising. You know, between four and seven years, it starts going back down again. And so it appears that something good began to happen with Ryan. And in looking for solutions to his dilemma, we have to take that part into account as well. So picking up on last week's discussion, when we identify causes, we are saying what introduced so much static into feeding that the child's natural regulatory ability was undermined. I address these causes in the article I gave you uh, and also in your child's weight. Let's go through the growth charts I just showed you to illustrate the causes. First of all, misinterpretation of normal growth or growth agenda. 
Erica's parents assumed that since she was a big infant with a hearty appetite that she would grow up to be a fat adult. And so they began restricting her. Uh, giving the show away here, they established a division of responsibility and later on she began to slim down. So, you know, the Cliff Notes version is restriction here, excessive weight gain, division of responsibility, and then gradual slimming over time. And we see the same pattern on her Z score on her Z score chart, except we know that it's more re, uh, reliably calibrated. Erica was an aggressive infant who was not about to be overfed, and so she put a lot of pressure on feeding and gained to well above the 97th percentile within a month, which is pretty drastic. And at that point, her weight more or less leveled off. Her parents, um, when she was two years old, her parents read Child of Mine and thought the division of responsibility made a lot of sense. They instituted it and were very convinced that they needed to do that because they hung in there while Erica ate, while there was no tomorrow. Eventually her eating settled down and her weight gradually crept downward toward the mean over the next four years, ending up by plotting somewhere around the 90th percentile at six and a half years of age. Here she is at age seven years. We long for growth data, I certainly do after that, but we'll have to settle for this picture of Erica at 13 years. She's relaxed and positive about her eating, feels good in her body. I'm sure you know children who show the same slimming pattern. Struggles around eating and about weight will prevent that slimming. Interestingly, this is Erica's older brother, and he was her physical opposite. His weight, his growth was low and slow, and his parents struggled to get him to eat more. They established the division of responsible responsibility for both of them at the same time. For a while, Erica ate a lot and her brother ate very little. Their parents kept their nerve and after a few weeks, both children began eating moderately. The moral of the story is to apply the division of responsibility throughout the growing up years. Child of mine goes up through the preschool years and this handout, which is on the ESI list of handouts that you've been given for this webinar, this handout summarizes the developmental principles in Child of Mine. Your child's weight is also developmentally focused and goes through the teen years, as does the feeding tutorial that I have been drawing your attention to. And this summarizes the same feeding principles as in the handout that I just showed you. Um, let's just look at this one, feeding your preschooler. In every case, you can print these off and use them in your own practice as long as you include the copyright statement. As long as you leave it unchanged, you don't charge for it and you include the entire copyright statement, you can make it your own. Erica's parents, well, let me give you a chance to read this. Erica's parents read about the division of responsibility, accepted it, and applied it correctly. Uh, a book is primary intervention. If you see people once or once in a while, it's primary intervention. If you see them occasionally in your office, it's primary intervention. And Erica's parents are the ideal people for that kind of setting because they could do it with education and intervention. But all parents are not created equal, as you very well know. Some parents need ongoing help and support to institute the division of responsibility and do it properly. Others are dealing with such significant inner or outer issues that 
it prevents them from uh, doing the division of responsibility until those issues are resolved. And we'll have some examples of that. Misinterpretation of Erica's normal growth precipitated restrained feeding, is, as is often the case. Child overweight often grows out of a combination of these causes, not just one cause or the other. And we've encountered Haley a number of times. <clears throat> and there are a number of points here where we could have asked the question. In fact, we could have asked the question right here. What happened here? How is feeding going? Chances are we would have found out that feeding was going very well and that the parents were feeding her on demand and paying attention to her cues, as evidenced by the fact that she got on a particular growth curve and stayed there um, and demonstrated amply that she was a good regulator, that she had the ability to regulate her food intake. But at this point, the doctor lost her nerve, and I, I had the chart. I know this happen. Sometimes, many times parents report inaccurate stuff, but not in this case. The doctor said she weighs too much. Well, Haley's mother responded strongly to the doctor's observation because she herself was rigid and restrictive about eating and vigilant about her own weight. And so she forced Haley's weight down to the 90th percentile. I hope to heaven that this is an error because if, if it wasn't, the kid was being uh, outright starved, but by 16 months, the mother says she was a voracious eater. Well, of course she was a voracious eater. She was a toddler, she was hungry, and she was not about to be made to go without. So the struggles around eating. At 19 months, Haley's uh, situation improved. Our family moved to a new place. The new doctor didn't worry about weight, and her mother went back to and Haley's care and feeding was turned over to the father. Um, as we see in the, this BMI chart, Haley's weight returned to the 90th percentile and stabilized. But at seven years, her mother again took over the feeding. Haley was diagnosed as being at risk of overweight. Here she is. She's 90th percentile BMI. And again, um, began being fed in a restrained fashion. Haley reacted more, uh, reacted by eating more and gaining too much weight. Well, she was sensitized. I mean, it was like she had PTSD. She knew what it felt like to be hungry, and she was really, really afraid of it. And so she became food preoccupied pronto and gained weight. And so the struggles began once again. What do you do instead? Well, it would have been so much better back at 10 months of age if the, um, if the doctor had uh, talked to the parents about feeding the child that I call the almost toddler, you know, the one that's ready to get to the family table. Get started with family meals, let the child feed herself, eat much or little, fast or slow, uh, what Learning to like new foods is all about giving lots of chances to um, try to learn to like new food, having sit-down snacks, division of response, responsibility, the whole shebang. Or, you know, back when Haley was diagnosed as being, uh, you know, here, when she, she's what, she's seven and a half years old and, and the restrained feeding started, it would have been so much better to take a look at uh, feeding your uh, school age child and um, let's see ages and stages here we have on the website under child development feeding your school age child um, and then you know talking to them about three family meals letting her eat much or little um, uh, the, probably the, the developmental change for the school age child is letting the child earn the responsibility of managing her own after school snacks, right after school and at the table. And that after she learns to go by the snacking rules, letting her choose her own snacks, even if it is high in fat and high in sugar. And you know these kids this age are going to eat at the, um, 
you know, stop at the corner store and eat at their friends' houses. So you just have to give them a mechanism where they can incorporate those foods and have some independence as long as they are sticking to the schedule. That's the important thing. Right after school uh, and not snacking along. Can parents, okay, now I'm getting ahead of myself. Okay, um, I talked about restrained feeding, and here it is. Restrained feeding is so common in our culture that it appears to be normal eating. It is not. Restrained feeding attempts to ignore and overwhelm the child's internal regulators of hunger and appetite and satiety. Haley's parents required tertiary intervention. Her mother was so rigid that she was incapable of giving Haley autonomy with her eating. Her father's way of dealing with his wife's rigidity was to get around her. He and Haley would sneak off to eat the food that mother wouldn't allow at home. These underlying issues would have to be resolved for parents to consistently administer the division of responsibility. Both parents will also likely benefit from treatment to increase their own eating competence. The child who's fed in a restrained fashion becomes afraid of going hungry and inclined to overeat when she gets the chance. The same thing happens with lack of structure in feeding and with food insecurity. With both structure and giving the child enough to eat are essential. Clearly, restrained feeding is a poor feeding practice. There are plenty of others. Rather than trying to decipher these growth charts, let's go directly to the D-score chart. The question here is, at what point did enough static enter the feeding relationship sufficient to undermine Ryan's internal regulators? It may have been a cumulative process. Solids were started too early, there's three months of age. Now, Solid foods, per se, do not overwhelm a child's regulatory ability. A child eating solids eats less breast milk or formula and regulates just fine. But typically, two young infants accept solids reluctantly, parents get pushy, and they struggle about feeding. It's the struggle that's the problem, not the solids. Lack of structure. Judging by what happened later, Ryan's parents were unlikely to have established structured meals and snacks and when he needed them. Being allowed to eat whenever he wanted to apparently undermined Ryan's ability to regulate food intake and grow appropriately. And by 18 months, he had gained quite a bit of weight. He, he went from about what was probably around the 90th percentile to well above the 97th percentile. Rather than asking the feeding questions and identifying the cause of Ryan's dysregulation, the doctor imposed food restriction when Ryan was about 18 months old. And his weight did dip down a little bit, but then he got the upper hand again with feeding, and it really took off. By the time I met them, Ryan's parents were gone a lot, working and socializing. They rarely had meals, and when they did, they were diet meals. But Ryan was a resourceful boy who was not about to go hungry. He made the rounds of his relatives in their small town, and each one said, oh, he's not too bad, and fed him. I advised the parents to build on that strength to round up the relatives and organize a feeding schedule for Ryan. They were offended by the advice and told the doctor that they wanted to see a real dietitian who could tell them what and how much to feed Ryan. I don't know what caused this dip in Z-score. It may have something to do with Ryan starting school, which would have offered him the structure and reliability 
that he was so sorely lacking at home. What to do instead? Well, starting solid foods based on what Ryan could do, not how old he was when he could sit up and see the spoon coming and open his mouth. Um, for feeding the toddler, um, the, um, here's the time that you really have to have structure in place. Even if parents miss the almost toddler time of getting that young child to the table, here's where you have to get started with family meals. Um, understanding normal eating behavior that the toddler is eating is real erratic and following a division of responsibility in feeding. You know, all of these handouts are, are tutorials, really. Uh, parents enter via a particular topic and then other issues arrive. You know, you have to have family meals and what is the child's normal eating like? And so it kind of opens up the top. You enter via one question, and then you end up being rolled over into other considerations that you have to know about in order to do a good job with feeding. Ryan's parents were erring both with respect to giving too little support and doing too much interference. And I told you last week about all the interference that parents do with eating. <clears throat> Ryan's parents were definitely in the tertiary category, but they did have the luxury of support in the form of their extended family. And that could have bailed them out with Ryan, but they chose not to see it that way, which was unfortunate. You may encounter extended families living in the same home. And perhaps you can interest them in structure on behalf of the child, where you certainly wouldn't be able to interest them in eating or avoiding certain foods. Structure is the bottom line. By now, you're catching on that these causes can run together, and the children can show more than one cause. Ryan certainly had a lot of stress in his life which could have exacerbated his excessive weight gain. Um, Christopher's early growth record shows, uh, and Christopher, though, is a person who really shows the effects of stress. His early growth record shows gradual acceleration toward the mean, as I told you. And so um, at any point along the way, you can ask your feeding questions. You know, you're not trying to diagnose anything with those feeding questions. You're just making sure that things are going well. And here he is at 12 months. Uh, here would have been a good time to ask, um, uh, ask feeding questions or give anticipatory guidance. If we had uh, taken a look at, you know, if the, parent, if the doctor or the the health worker had talked about division of responsibility and feeding, um, family meals and sit-down snacks at that point, it would have been um, uh, extremely helpful because um, what happened was that um, Christopher was fed with food handouts all day, every day, that there was no structure instituted at this point. He continued to be fed on demand as if he was a baby. His mother said that she couldn't tell him no because she was afraid he wouldn't like her. You could have worked with her to optimize feeding and the later weight gain would have been headed out. You could have done it here as well. I mean, there was a flip there and you say, okay, what's going on here? How is feeding going? How do you, would you like anything to be different? This spike in weight was stress related. During a period of severe stress in the family, Christopher greatly increased his pressure on food, a pressure that he'd learned to exert back then. And uh, growing out of the, he had learned to use food for emotional reasons. You know, I didn't plot these scores for Christopher, but I should have because he was below the curve here and above the curve there.
As a toddler, Christopher needed structure and limits. Failing both, he did not get his emotional needs met. Rather than being fed in a structured fashion, Christopher was allowed to graze for food, and that created the feeding chaos that I talk, chaos that I talked to you talked to you about last week. Children learn to use food for emotional reasons when they don't get enough to eat on the one hand or when they are regularly pacified with food on the other. And who has lived with a toddler and not been tempted to pacify with food? Either way, the child's needs don't get met and their stress accumulates and they learn to use food for emotional reasons. So we come to intervention. This star means that this is your universal, all-purpose, do-no-harm prevention and treatment intervention. You can administer this with time when time is short, as it is for all of us. If you throw in anticipatory guidance with stage-related feeding, you will go a very far way toward preventing child obesity. If you're an MD, don't underestimate the impact of making these recommendations. A story I tell in Your Child's Weight is of a rapidly gaining six-year-old who ate so much that he threw up at every meal. He was taken to an endocrinologist who asked feeding questions. He found out that the child was a tail ender, the parents had gone out of the business of parenting, and family meals were only a sometimes thing. Since the boy never knew when he would be fed, he ate as much as he could whenever he could. Have three meals and two sit-down snacks a day, the doctor told the parents. The parents did just that, and within two weeks, the child had stopped growing up. This is an additional slide from your uh, handout on the ESI website. While the cases I discussed with you are complicated, in some ways they're easier because parents accept that their child has a weight issue. As you know, parents do not like to be told that their child is obese or even overweight and are likely to reject intervention. You don't have to convince the parent that the child has a weight problem. In fact, it's better not to because concerned parents restrict and restriction exacerbate the problem. Instead of that, address the parent's feeding concerns and solve the feeding problems that they bring to you. That um, the solutions to the feeding problems are very much the same. In fact, they're virtually identical to that start slide that I showed you a while ago. And it all goes about the same. Uh, division of responsibility of feeding, the child's process of learning to like food, regular meals and snacks, don't pressure her in any way to eat, and so on. And so um, uh, in, in, in addressing the child's picky eating or whatever problem the parent um, brings to you, you are instituting these, this intervention that I just told you about. Teaching stage-related feeding is so important, and essentially what that allows you to do is institute a division of responsibility throughout the child's growing up years. So what is the process of change? Um, well, I'll give you a chance to read again. We're going to stay on this slide for a while. Process of change. It can take parents um, a year or more to get the meal habit and establish structured meals and snacks until or unless they do that, the child's eating will continue to be erratic and the child's weight acceleration will be unchanged. In a primary care setting, you'll sound like a broken record as parents come back or follow-up, and you will say, how are meals going? How are you doing with structured snacks? You know, are you being successful with not letting your child's hand handle for food? And keep it up till the parents 
are able to give you a positive report. How long does change take? Once parents establish structure and reliably give the child autonomy with eating, the child's eating will be extreme, become more extreme. After a while, however, she'll begin to trust that the parent really will allow her to eat as much as she wants. She'll discover her internal regulators and her eating will moderate. The first time you do this are really alarming because you wonder if the child's eating will ever settle down. For an infant, it can take days to get through that part. For a toddler, a week or two. For a preschooler, a month or so. A school-age child, a child, two or three months. Of course, parents have to keep doing their part with feeding or the child's eating behavior never gets better. And if the parents relapse with feeding, the child will relapse with eating. Follow-up. If you're in a position to do secondary intervention, which includes treatment planning and follow-up, you can work with parents on the process of change. The beginning treatment plan is essentially the same as on the starred slide. In my work with parents, I've tried to break the plan apart into smaller steps, but it doesn't seem to work. It seems that having structured meals, snacks, is essential to the success of family meals, and even though you uh, um, uh, success of family meals and not letting the child graze is central to both. But even though you lay it all out up front, there's still plenty of work to do in follow-up. Parents benefit from help and, help and support in establishing structure and extinguishing interference. The second is the trickiest. Parents will have many ways of interfering with the child's autonomy with eating, and you have to ferret those out and extinguish and extinguish them. The slide about restrained feeding gives you a place to start. Weight predictions. In my experience, once parents establish DOR, the child's weight acceleration levels off and she or he begins growing at a consistent percentile or z-score. For some children, like Erica, weight gain returns to a lower level. It all depends on whether the child has metabolically adjusted to the higher weight. In that case, a positive outcome is stabilizing at a consistent percentile or z-score. Will, will it work? Well, it all depends on what you mean by work. Will, will children discover their internal regulators? Yes, as long as parents consistently do their part with feeding. Will children attain a BMI below the 85th or even the 95th percentile? Not necessarily. The outcome goal is consistent weight, not weight below a particular percentile. <clears throat> like Ryan's parents, after listening to my recommendations, you may feel the need to find a real dietitian who tells you what and how much the child should eat. You may also lose your nerve during those white knuckle times while you wait for the child to discover internal regulation and reach for some of these conventional solutions. However, you have to ask yourself, will your intervention do more harm than good? As you'll discover, the division of responsibility is not for sissies. All of the interventions represent crossing of the lines of division of responsibility and feeding and will undermine the child's ability to regulate food intake. With the division of responsibility, we're working toward harmonious feeding where parents and children both get their needs met, the parents to nurture and the child to be nurtured. You have to trust. You have to feed children well, then let them grow up to get bodies that are right for them. 
We have, so let's turn to questions. I have some to get started with, and then Karen has some others. Um, we have a number of questions about the nuts and bolts of feeding, the begging toddler, what to do about dessert, the finicky child, the child who won't eat vegetables. These are, these are such great questions that I would really like it if you would put them on the Ellen Satter Associates Facebook page. Then I can answer you individually, and others will benefit from the information as well. You can also look for answers to your questions in my books and in my website articles that I've been showing you, those brief articles about stage-appropriate feeding and childhood feeding problems. Um, there's a question about the adopted and food hoarding child. Um, I wrote about that in a family meals focus um, issue about a year ago. If you look on my, well, let's look on my website right now, and let's go back here, and here we have Family Meals Focus Newsletter. Um, here it is, Adoptive and Foster uh, Children and Distorted Eating Attitudes and Behaviors. The Cliff Notes version is maintain structure, let the child eat as much as he wants at meals and snacks, and reassure him or her over and over again uh, by word and deed that there will be enough to eat. Um, some people, and Karen, this is the last question I'll answer before it'll be you over to you. Um, some people are following the feeding dynamics and eating competence models and wondering how to get their colleagues on board. Well, thank you for answering that question. I, I'm sorry to tell you, though, that GET is a control word. You can't get your colleagues to do anything, but you can expose them to the possibilities and let them decide. Um, here's one way you can do that is to say your piece to them and um, be ready to work with the treatment dropouts. Meanwhile, your colleagues will find out that the conventional approaches are laborious, they don't work, and they do harm. That's when you can show your evidence, your glowing evidence, with the treatment dropout. Another approach is that when a child is referred for weight loss, do an evaluation of the child and family. Chances are good that the child's weight is accelerating and that the acceleration is being caused by one or more of the four factors I just talked about. You can then uh, talk with the referral source about first addressing those factors before you consider the issue of food restriction and weight loss. Okay, Erin, are you there? I am. And I do have a few questions. A lot of questions have come in, but I've taken just a few of them. Um, a toddler follows fifth percentile for weight for six to ten months and then drops off and plateaus for the next six months. M the MD and parents are very concerned and send the child to an RD. I have discussed ways to increase calories, etc. But now I'm thinking that wasn't what I should have done. How would you have handled this? Yeah. Well, I think after today's discussion, you, um, uh, yeah, you, you can, you have some pretty good ideas, don't you? You look over the child's uh, growth record from birth, um, and you, um, you know, you get a feeding history. You know, how did feeding go when he was a baby? Did they feed on demand? When were solids started? What was that like? And so on. And then specifically at the time that the child's growth dropped off. You, uh, you want to get to the bottom of that. You want to say, find out what changed here, um, what happened that the child seemingly lost the ability to regulate food intake and eat as much as he needed. Because, you know, children don't just do that. Something has to happen. And whatever the interference was, you can correct that and then um, make really sure that you don't uh, do anything that puts pressure on feeding, like trying to get certain foods into the child 
yeah, feed the child in a developmentally appropriate way, make sure that the child is being offered meals that have carbohydrate, protein, and snack and fat, that you're neither, you know, overdosing him with fat or restricting fat. And then you keep your fingers crossed and trust that the child's hunger and appetite will kick in and that he'll gradually sneak up on that growth chart. Of course, you know, uh, having been referred by the doctor, I'm assuming that the doctor has ruled out medical causes as well. So please don't think that I'm saying that all of this needs to happen uh, in a vacuum, you know, out of the context text of knowing what is going on with the child medically, because that certainly is very important. Thank you for that question. Um, the next question. Do you have a feeding assessment form to use with families that you could share with us or with the person who wrote in? Or do you just use the eating competence questionnaire? Um, that seems more applicable for adults and older kids. Wondering what right. questions yeah. to ask parents of younger children. <clears throat> The eating competence questionnaire is for um, appropriate for anybody who's living on their own. So it's kicked in with adolescents who've left home and are now managing the context for their own eating. The in um, your child's weight, in one of the appendixes, I outline the assessment, that multi-part assessment for finding out what's going on with children's eating. Um, and with and with feeding, uh, when you have a child whose growth is faltering or they're you know really established feeding problems, so there is that. It's an assessment that you would administer in a clinical setting. But I think you're driving at a questionnaire, um, and you know I have an old questionnaire on my website that people are still using. It's under resources, and if you've looked at resources, you know there's an awful lot here. Um, just for fun, test and assessment, feeding your child test and scoring sheet um, is on my website. Now, that is not validated. You can use it, and it'll give you some clues about what's going on with feeding, but it's not validated. Um, I'm currently working. How do I get rid of all this? I'm currently working with Barbara Losey um, to um, create a validated questionnaire about feeding. Um, but it's um, and, and we're going to validate it by actually observing feeding, and so it'll be an excellent questionnaire. But it's um, and it'll be for two to five years year olds, and we're going to keep going until we get a questionnaire for older kids as well, but it's going to be slow. It's really a laborious process. And of answer, and over to Karen. Next question. Regarding toddler nutrition, how does a parent or caregiver restrict or monitor a child when he or she wants to eat the entire bag of chips or fruit snacks or food of low nutritional quality without feeling that they're restricting? Mm -hmm. OK, well, here we are. I lost my website. I got all panicky. Um, how to feed children. Um, I think we're in the area of using forbidden food. How much time do I have? Um, I had a number of questions about dessert. I'm going to start enter the topic here. And I, uh, my advice about dessert is to put a single serving of dessert on the table uh, when you set the table and let the child eat it when they want to, before, after, or during the meal. And children surprise us. They, um, uh, it's only to us that dessert marks the end of the meal. The child will eat his dessert and go back to eating the other food. I think I started this in the wrong place. Well, we're talking about sweets now. We'll come back to chips. So in, in restricting the amount of dessert that you put on at mealtime and essentially breaking the rules of the division of responsibility, you are setting up scarcity of sweets. And whenever you set up scarcity, the child's going to be preoccupied with that food and overeat on it when he gets a chance. And so you have to neutralize that. And the way to neutralize it, and um, I'm going to take this off because you're trying to look at it and listen to me at the same time. 
um, the, the way to neutralize that is to um, have sweets at snack time. And at snack time, you put on a plate of cookies and some milk and let the child eat as many cookies as he wants. At first, he'll eat like there's no tomorrow, because, but then the newness will wear off, and he will eat two or three cookies and go off and do something else. You need to neutralize chips as well, but they're easier because um, chips along with the meal with sandwiches are not going to replace the other food in the meal. For some reason, children don't seem to fill up on chips like they do on dessert. And so you just put out a big bowl of chips every now and again and make sure there's enough to go around and everybody gets their fill, and that neutralizes the chips issue. So do take a look at this Using Forbidden Food handout that I just showed you. It's under um, Family Meals and Snacks, How to Feed Children on my website. And it is a critical issue in feeding, and I, I would really encourage you to think carefully about how to do that because it is important. Okay, did I answer it all, all the parts of it, Karen? Um, yes, you did. And we have, um, hopefully we have time for one more. What do you do about low-income families who do not have sufficient food? Oh boy, that's a political question, isn't it? Um, you know, you try to, well, I, I will not give the political answer, although one is tempted. But, um, you know, it's important not to insist on eating high on the pyramid or, you know, insisting on filling half the plate with fruits and vegetables because those are low caloric density foods and relatively expensive foods. It's really better to help people choose low cost foods that are high enough in caloric density that they have a chance of filling themselves and their children up. It's better to spend the money on whole milk than it is on skim milk uh, and the cost differential is very low if at all and people are going to be filled up better on whole milk. And you know, helping them certainly to find lower cost source, sources of vegetables and fruits, but uh, thinking in terms, uh, always thinking in terms of helping them get enough calories, helping them get filled up at their regular meals and snacks. So with that alarming advice, I will turn things back over to Karen and she'll wrap up. Thank you all for joining in with us today. Thank you, Ellen. Um, I'm going to ask Tammy or Dr. Lester, did you want to summarize anything that um, you might have spoke about at the beginning of the webinar, or I can just wrap up as well, or if you want to insert something, we certainly have a minute or so for that. Sure, Karen, uh, we can go through those last couple of slides on, on how to get the CME credit and whatnot. OK. And I'll turn uh, it over so, to you. OK. So you should, re, uh, you should be receiving an email that, that will have a post-test and evaluation link um, that answers 70% of those questions correctly, uh, and then you'll receive your, your certificate. Uh, this is just our Childhood Obesity Prevention Project website. If you're interested in more information there, I apologize for the dinging through the first part. Uh, of it, the resources that are available through the Foster Healthy Weight and Use uh, resources and, and where you can get those. And then uh, the encore of last week's webinar as well as this week's webinar will be available on the Nebraska Medical Association's Childhood Obesity Prevention Project website uh, or the Ellen, Ellen Satter Institute website uh, within the next couple of weeks. So uh, I think that's all I had, Erin, if you want to and we want to thank Ellen, of course, for, for uh, being the speaker these last couple of weeks and, and providing us with all this information. Thank you so much, Dr. Lester. And I will, 
I'll leave it on that screen. I think it's fine. But in summary and in closing, I wanted to thank all of you, uh, the audience, for joining us and staying on with us while I figured out and learned the technical innuendos of trying to run a webinar. So my apologies for what happened in the beginning with that uh, ringing bell. Um, and I want you to know and uh, what Dr. Lester said is you will be receiving an email in about one hour, um, a post-webinar email thanking you for joining us today again. And also it contains a link that will take you to um, completing the post-test and the evaluation. So one more thing, um, in that email that you'll receive, we are having another webinar starting in April. It's a three-part, no-cost webinar again. Um, raising special needs children to be competent eaters. There is a bit more description of that on the email you'll receive today. And then watch your inbox as we will be giving you more information and an opportunity to register as the time draws near. So with that, thank you so much. Thank you again, and have a great afternoon.